right here. Let's do this, Kara. It's I'm going to hand this over now to you. Super. Thank you so much, Holger, uh, for inviting me for the talk. And I'm also really super excited to join the team at London Institute of Photography. And thanks so much, everyone who made it today uh, on Zoom and for those people watching the replay later on. OK, super. Um, so I'll start with a bit brief intro um, about myself and, and, and the presentation. Um, so I've been working as a freelance photographer for about 10 years. And um, in the talk, I'm going to share um, the experience in starting out, uh, fo focusing on NGO work, uh, but also spilling over into editorial. So I'll touch on how the type and use of images by NGOs have ev has evolved over time. And um, I'll share some lessons learned and, and how to do better. Okay. Um, so I really like this concept of, you know, looking at your life as if we're all um, running on the main road. So nothing is really a waste of time. And even realizing what is not for you, whenever that happens, um, is equally important. So I study business, um, and at the end of my BA, I had an internship opportunity. So I honestly always felt quite out of place uh, during my business degree. So when the experience came up, when this, this work experience came up, I naturally gravitated towards a place and an environment that was really different to what I had been exposed to in university. So um, this was a a street children NGO in New Delhi. So I spent over four months in India, which was really eye-opening and, uh, and a very formative experience. This was in my early 20s. And um, it even led me to pursue further studies in development. So um, first of all, maybe we can talk a bit about a, a background. Um, about, uh, let's say, basically shifts in how NGOs motivate um, support for their work. So concerning representations, we see basically, you know, massive shifts happening from um, seeing people as passive recipients of humanitarian development aid, for example, you know, they, we see them as um, we go to seeing them as agents of their own change. So we have a shift um, in imagery that the NGOs use from exploitative images for fundraising to trying to balance with more contextual storytelling that is less about an appeal for cash as it is about celebrating the successes that NGOs have delivered or the complex realities of the situation. Of course, it's important to find a balance between um, negative realities and positive portrayal. So it's really important for photographers to get consent, to tell them what the image, tell people that are being photographed what the images will be used for and provide detailed captions to the NGOs so that they can use this to paint a balanced picture. Um, Lots of changes in the media landscape, of course, our society is becoming more and more visual. Um, we see a massive change in how images are consumed from the sort of traditional newspaper, you know, and magazines back in the days to social media. Um, and more recently, even the, the use of immersive technology for both fundraising, education and behavior change. So we're talking about VR, AR and 360. Um, and then shifts in engagement. So participatory projects like Photo Voice, um, where basically it's all about training communities um, to tell their own stories. So we see how on the left hand side, we definitely see a, cha a change in how images are disseminated from the 1980s ad in the newspaper. Uh, and then below we see the TV ad from Save the Children in the early 2000s. Um, at the time, what we I think is worth mentioning also the context that actually at the time the newspaper ad was really successful, uh, as in it, it, it brought about 23 million 
for famine relief in Ethiopia over four years. But basically what happened in short is that, um, you know, many people realized that these kinds of images were not appropriate. And so people in developing countries, you know, basically they, they weren't incapable or they were not passively awaiting some sort of rescue from the white man. So we see, I, I just quickly picked a few examples on the right from the recent crisis in Ukraine. Um, just we can see, we can, we can kind of see um, uh, a shift, you know, towards using images about em empathy and storytelling um, to get the viewer's attention and to solicit a response. So this project in particular, for some reason, really, really stayed with me. And I remember seeing it in 2015 before uh, it was awarded the uh, Ropers Photo Award uh, in the, a year later. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a portrait from a series called, series called Lost Family Portraits about people who escaped the war in Syria and found refuge in Lebanon. So Miti Dieri uh, photographed this for Caritas International. Um, he photographed 12 families in two refugee camps. It's all, it's all a reminder of you know, the refugee crisis and the destructive power that war has over families and, and especially a reminder of the families who are left behind. The campaign raised half a million pounds so we're talking about like 5,000% uh, of the production budget. It was featured in loads of international magazines, media outlets. It also won the World Press Photo Award. So of course it got great press coverage. Um, something that was quite different, I don't know if it was the first time, but um, was the fact that it was commissioned by an advertising agency with the purpose of raising money for an aid agency. So the photographer himself developed it together with the director of the agency. And I think, you know, many things like really struck me, but I guess what, what stayed with me the most was, I mean, of course, I think it was a beautiful, beautiful series. So strong portraits, you know, technically, of course, using the, the techniques, using a frame within a frame, which places emphasis, emphasis on people, but also keeps some background visible. Um, providing some context and, and a sense of place. Um, and the second thing that really stayed with me was the idea of how important it is to, to have a concept, you know, to, to really have some thinking behind a project. So it, in this case, it focuses on the people that are left behind, not the people that are trying to reach Europe. And, and the empty spaces or the empty chairs are, are the you know they they symbolize the uh, the missing family members. So when I saw this, something really entered la like my brain. I was like, okay, Chiara, you know, you need to think. You need to use your brain, not just take pictures. Um, so before I dive into my work, I just wanted to recap some different ways um, that you can get involved with NGOs, and we're going to see many of these as I go through uh, my experience. Um, so you can always work for them as a, as a staff employed full time. This is usually for the big old organizations that can afford to have dedicated departments. So I've got quite a few colleagues that, you know, after years of freelancing, experience with us, Associated Press, maybe 10 years of freelancing, they just decided they wanted um, a full time job with more security and, and everything. Um, they're often based in uh, regional or global headquarters like Geneva, New York, London, Nairobi, Panama, etc. Um, and yeah, often I just saw, you know, they've got from social media positions to producers to heads of content, video editors, photo editors, etc. Or you can um, work for them as freelance, so you can join rosters. Usually rosters have a, like a short application, like a motivation letter and a portfolio. Um, or, um, you know, others have more specific requirements, like they, they carry out special background checks if they're working on sensitive topics. You can be contracted for individual assignments. Um, you can also work for them as an educator or a trainer. 
So for example, giving photography workshops, basically tra training staff. And, and a couple of times I've prepared some photography guidelines for aid workers or participatory projects like Photo Voice, which, is, which are about um, community engagement. So training communities to tell their own story. And you can always collaborate with them uh, for, you know, in many ways to have access for your own projects or for, uh, for grants or for editorial, editorial content. I will explore some of the ways in which I've engaged with them and which are most of these through my journey. So in my early 20s, my interest and passion for photography grew exponentially. And I started to take some evening courses, weekend workshops. And some months later, actually maybe a, a year later, um, I ended up landing a part-time job as an assistant to a documentary photographer. This was uh, in Milan. It really, really lit my fire. And it was the first time I was really, really, really passion passionate about something. And I ended up working with him for three years. I learned so much about photography um, itself, but as well as the profession. And he's still a mentor for me to this day. He's a, a bit of a spiritual father. But then at some point it was time to sail on my own. So I decided to move in 2015 to uh, Myanmar, Burma. I traveled there a year before and I just fell in love with the country and its people, which were the most genuine and kind I ever encountered. Kiara, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt. I've got a question about yeah. assisting a documentary photographer. Yeah. Um, because that's a question that really comes up really quite often in mm -hmm. our class, for example, run a module that's called Photography Careers that includes mm -hmm. like assisting, etc. And um, so for me, assisting was usually something that you rather do, let's say, like for maybe commercial photographers where the assistant was actually like involved on photo shoots, for example, with setting up mm -hmm. the uh, setting up the lighting, etc., organizing the shoot. Um, how did your how did your work as an assistant for a documentary photographer look like? Were yeah. you involved in the shoots as well? well? Was it more like the admin side of things? Could you maybe just talk about that in a few sentences? Yeah. I think it was it was a bit different because most of the time, um, you know, I, I wouldn't travel to the locations where he was working with him, um, although occasionally. He, Occasionally, he would have some kind of portrait assigned. And we were talking about assisting, right? Uh, yeah. Photojournalists, yeah. So I think most of the work was like, um, was about research. So like, uh, especially research for his own projects, but also ideas that um, he would pitch to editorial publications. So I remember, you know, for instance, he did, um, his name is Stefano De Luigi. You, you can check out his work, it's really great. He's in a seven agency. Um, he was doing, he did a project about um, the Odyssey, but basically it was all about visiting um, the locations where the Odyssey took place, but from a modern Odysseus point of view. So taking pictures with a smartphone. This was uh, one of the recent projects. So basically in this case I was researching, it was like, yeah, a lot of work, you know, mm. all the kind of um, uh, places and, and contacts and people he could get in touch with, right? Same thing with, I don't know, a, a story about technology in Estonia. Um, it was, yeah, a lot about contacts. Um, and then a lot of captions translating Italian to English, a lot of that I was helping out a bit as well with exhibitions mm -hmm. I mean I even drove his van with all the exhibitions from like Milan to somewhere in the Côte d'Azur in France and then to Paris and back <laughs> just to give an idea like mm -hmm. I it was a bit of everything but definitely not so much shooting so occasionally the occasional portrait here and there and it was very simple lighting. I mean, it was just basically like a, a flash on a monopod and I would hold that or maybe, you know, bounce a reflector. 
Mm. Okay, yeah. super. Great. Thank you so much, really. It's, it's really much. interesting to hear how um, how working as an assistant can actually work, you know, can happen in that mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Okay. Super. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So um, I decided to move to Myanmar. Um, and the more, you know, the more I read about the country, the more I found it uh, extremely fascinating, the, the political and historical development, um, you know, the, the contrasts as the place was opening up and it was soon to have its first free democratic elections. So basically I decided to, you know, my, my idea was to move there for like six or seven months to um, work on some projects and, and gain some work experience and really dive into like full-time freelancing. I thought that the perfect timing was to arrive before the, before the, the, the elections. Um, I really wanted to witness the moment, but I also thought it would bring uh, work opportunities because the whole media was finally watching. And photographing the elections didn't turn out to be a, a breakthrough career opportunity. Um, even though I made some really good personal and professional connections. But I really started to think um, how um, I was going to make it work. So I kind of came up with this strategy, which was mainly to focus on NGOs and editorial. And, and if any commercial would fit my style, of course, why not? Um, and, and I could always push that, um, but keeping really at the core, like uh, my personal work. And by, by personal work, I just mean um, self-initiated projects, not personal in the sense of like in, your intim intimate or personal stories, right? Um, I had the feeling that diversifying was necessary for this type of context in order to survive and make a living. But I also had the feeling that um, the different type of work would complement itself and one would blend into the other and I could definitely learn a bit from different sectors. So this was my first uh, failed. <laughs> I think it's very useful to, to share uh, professional failures as well. So my first tactic was to bombard more than 30 NGOs with an email, uh, basically, which was a terrible email. I don't even know how... I came up with this having studied even business and marketing, but um, I didn't even say who I was. I didn't even say that I had, you know, I had an internship experience. I studied development. I, I didn't even point them in the right direction to look at my website where I had already done a couple of documentary projects. Disaster. So as you can you can probably imagine, but um, none of this did led to work. I think I got maybe four replies, um, and actually one one came back with a work opportunity almost a, like a year and a half later. But I couldn't even take it because I was away. Um, so I really figured out I I had to build a specific portfolio. You know I think people. Uh, people want to put you in boxes. They also want to see that, you know, you have experience with certain things. Um, and so I just needed to have some NGO work in my portfolio. And I just put it here as a tip that it's super important to follow your heart and interest because you need to put your, a lot of energy in it and, and, and find something near and, and accessible uh, because you can come back to it if you need to, and you can build something, you know, something better. So I did some research and um, I was going to go to uh, Cambodia for a photography festival called um, Angkor Photo Festival. And I thought, you know, it would be amazing to combine it with some image taking. So I did some research and I came across Apopo, which is a Belgian NGO that works with giant rats that are trained for mine detection. They're active in Angola, Cambodia, and Mozambique. And I thought it would have been a really nice idea to, to do a portrait series. I was really into portraits um, about the hero rats and their handlers. 
So I got in touch uh, maybe one month earlier or, or two before the trip uh, with them and everything worked out. This was, I didn't have much time at all. So it was a bit tricky because I think I shot these in like maybe two hours. Um, but it was a great opportunity to you know, start building a portfolio, to meet people and, and start building a network as well. Then an opportunity came naturally um, between uh, both an NGO and a magazine. So basically I was contacted by a journalist that was carrying out an editorial collaboration with the Italian magazine Yo Donna and says the NGO. Um, and the assignment was going to take place in rural, Mar rural Myanmar where the NGO works and then also in, in, in Yangon. So there was a bit of a urban and rural element to it. In this case, I was hired by the magazine, but the NGO organized uh, all the travel and covered the travel expense, expenses. So this was great because it gave me both NGO and editorial experience. And, um, and it was a nice addition to, to my portfolio that was touching on um, rural and urban, tradition and modernity. So then I had to kind of, I, I basically gave it another go with the email thing. <laughs> but I also, I also figured out that I really needed to be proactive, that just emailing was not going to be enough. But this, was a, this is a better version of my first email. To be honest, it's not great either. But at least I introduced myself. I said, I, you know, I said that I studied development that I had four years of experience, that I traveled the country extensively, that I had been studying the local language. I put the link to my website. Um, I also mentioned the person that mentioned that there was potentially some work on their projects and blah, 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 if we could collaborate. It didn't really work out, um, but it was still it, it, with, with this specific case, right? But I still sent out some um, I still reached out to some contacts and but what I really got away from it is that I needed to be proactive so I was in parallel to the emails I was keeping an ear out for interesting projects and, and I heard from a manager of the Italian NGO Oikos that they were conducting the first scientific study of the sun bear population in Myanmar using camera traps the sun bear is a threatened species due to habitat loss and commercial hunting. So they're, they're commonly poached in the region for their gallbladder, for, for their bile. And they're also used, uh, which, is, which is used as traditional Chinese medicine, as well as um, bear paws, which are an expensive delicacy. So when, when I heard about their project, I thought, gosh, like, this is amazing. Working with them would allow me to, to do this interesting story that I really care about. And if I, you know, if I do it well, it, it might also be sellable to, to an outlet. And plus what an adventure to go in the forest. So this was us. I did two trips, six days each. It was super tough <laughs> because we were literally walking all day. So basically they lay down these camera traps, uh, which record, and I don't remember for how long, but then uh, they need to go back uh, change batteries and change memory cards um, and so you can see in the pictures an example of the camera trap on the right and then the sun bear on the left on the top left recorded by the camera trap and this was us camping in the forest one of the rangers from the forest department on the hammock what I what I figured out while working with the angel is that I was missing some material in order to create a complete story sellable to, to a magazine. And I was missing like a, more about the sun bear. So I went to the Yangon Zoo on the right. This is a picture that I took. And then I also got in touch with a researcher on uh, wildlife trafficking and he was, was super nice. And I was able to use his photo in the pitch. Um, 
so now sadly uh, I was not able to sell this to any editorial outlets because nobody cares about the poor sound there but I still got um, what I got out of it is that actually my collaboration with the NGO started to grow so um, they also asked me to cover other projects in the same region because they needed some com comms material and then they had um, they wanted to do an exhibition in Yangon about their work so I ended up documenting their project with uh, women, the environment and community forests for food security. And it was a great opportunity because I had a lot of freedom. Um, I had time. Um, and I think, I think I really, really tried to do my thing. I, I wanted to, great, to create strong images, but also really to show a connection and and some positivity. In the end, I really, I really figured out that you know you need optimism to have hope, and you need hope to change the world. So yeah, this this picture kind of yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Laura, um, we just have a few questions uh, yeah. piling up. So if you don't mind uh, me passing them on to you, the first sure. one is actually relates to something that you mentioned quite a while back. It's a question from Yoda. She asked, um, actually, <laughs> specifically, um, you were talking about the photographer that you used to assist and yeah. you said that you did actually, that he pitched ideas to an organization, an entity, and she asked what, what type of entity that actually was, or organization that actually was. Ah, he was pitching ideas like, uh, you mean for his work? I mean, usually it was like, either he was pitching stories for magazines, or he was doing, um, you know, like a grant applications where you apply with a story idea. Uh, there are some funding institutions um, that, that have funds dedicated to certain, usually it's divided by topic. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it was mostly editorial and grants. Mm -hmm. Super. Okay, thank you so much. We've got mm -hmm. a question by David. David asks, um, Kiara, in your mm -hmm. early work, did you always request funding or did you work for free in order to build your portfolio? Yeah, so um, basically while I was working part-time as an assistant for, for Stefano, uh, then um, on, the, on the side, on the rest, I was doing some photography jobs like events and weddings um to pay the bills and then whenever i could i really invested um in, in my project so the the first one that i did um i went to mongolia for three weeks i was super passionate about um a story of young um young young kids that compete in in, in this festival called nadam which is about horse racing so, for example, I spent like uh, three weeks with two different families, which was a lot of time for a story, but I think uh, it really allowed me to, um, to carry out uh, the story well. And I still remember that um, when I had a briefing with the first magazine that hired me, uh, I remember that they mentioned like, hey, you know, we would really love to see something like your Mongolia story. We really love it. So I think it really, really helped. It, it, was, it was an investment. I mean, I was also sleeping with them and it, it, I found a, a way to, of course, make it not, not crazy, right? Um, but um, yeah, definitely really, yeah, I definitely invested the mm. time and money. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Also, I think what is really interesting I think kind of concept that really kind of runs through, I guess, like all, all lots of photography businesses is that the more you reach out, uh, obviously the more it's going to come back, but very often it's not a direct line. So let's say like when you, I found it really interesting what you said that, for example, uh, some of your projects that didn't directly read in, let's say like the benefits that you were kind of hoping for, or mm -hmm. for example, when yeah. you send an email, so sometimes there might be a job offer actually coming one and a half years later, out of the blue, or totally. for example, when you're working yeah. on a on a certain project and maybe the uh, direct the direct connection projects that you were kind yeah. of eyeing at, they might not have materialized. 
But yeah. then something else happens. For example, they come back to you again and they have something else. So I think like this whole concept or this whole approach of just be out there, just push, 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 yeah. push, push, just all the time. You just never know what's going to happen, who's there basically just at that time, who sees your images. Okay. And then literally like two years later, out of the blue gives you this kind of job. And you go like, wow, where is it coming from? Yeah. But the yeah. more you do this kind of stuff, the, the just higher the chances are. Um, I've got another question here waiting for you from Iman. Mm -hmm. He asks, um, how did you feel when you got turned down on some of the opportunities? Did you still feel motivated to, to carry on doing photography or did you feel you weren't good enough? What's your advice on getting turned down? Oh God, this is really, I mean, it's still happening all the time. I mean, it's really hard. It's very, honestly, it's really, really hard. And, and rejection, <laughs> You get rejections all the time. So, you know, now, for example, I'm focusing on, on, on doing more and more grant applications to get funding. <laughs> and I mean, maybe I try, I put in 20 and, and I don't know, I get one. Like, uh, I think with time, I think it was really hard at the beginning. I really struggled. Um, and then you, you, you know, you reach a point where you kind of care less about it and you really, really get on with it. And you're just like, okay next but this is definitely one of the maybe the most important the, the most difficult thing about being a documentary photographer these days um and and the story in particular the story about the sun bear i was super super disappointed because i just had the feeling you know i thought it was a great story and it was really important to to talk about it and um but it's hard, you know, also magazines have their own agenda. So sometimes, and their own in, internal politics. So, you know, maybe they love the story, but for some reason, um, someone else in the magazine doesn't, or, you know, they're pushing towards other types of stories the next three months. So yeah, it's really tough. You really have to kind of, um, um, get like toughen toughen your skin somehow and really um not take it personally mm. okay super thank you so much for that super so well i put this slide in because it's really important to celebrate your success uh, and one example this was you know one of the first times that an ngo contacted me with a specific assignment um, so in this case it's a it was it was a swiss foundation that works on uh, hearing care and um, so i document it was a one-day assignment in a school a uh, school for the deaf in yangon and i received a nice organized example like a brief you know where they uh they basically told me everything like the location the project the description of the project the time the day the objective of the pictures what they needed the photos for website social media as well as their annual activity report some examples to look at format you know they wanted portrait and landscape they for the website they wanted widescreen um they even told me the style what they want like documentary authentic and natural emotional colorful positive uh, hearing aids should be visible if possible, key shots that I needed to have, uh, and as well as, you know, making sure I had captions. So I would ask the name of the children, background on hearing loss and their age. So I, I just put this in because normally, and then later on we'll see the other thing that, um, you know, you, you're supposed to receive is a, a contract. Um, and I'll, I'll have an example later on. Um, but it was really nice to have a easy direction, one day of work, I knew what to do. And mm. this was it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Chiara, I'm, I'm, I just really want to say, I'm so grateful you're sharing this information with us. Um, because I think it's very rare that someone, you know, kind of allows an audience like us really such a deep insight, really like into their business and how things work. You know, very often photographers are very protective and when it comes to briefing and the internal elements really like of their everyday job, they get very, very protective. And um, yeah, you know, in the end, we all learn by sharing 
information you know it's, it's, really? it's really it's about our passion and you know sharing really like our experience and just really want to say this i think that's really amazing thanks and we gotta help each other huh? i mean it's mm. uh, it's really important mm. the same thing happened with uh with court um so i had a precise briefing and i was documenting various projects that they had in, in northern Myanmar and one was the the midwifery training program so for example this is village midwife Nangangela um, and with some of the women women that she assisted in giving birth and then a completely different project here we have uh, Maut on the left and Utun on the right who joined the pig loan community project so I just wanted to show you, this is the other thing that, um, you know, you should just see, this is just a sort of um, summary, right? So the contract usually has a lot of legal jargon, maybe five, six pages, but basically they expand on these terms. So, um, you know, they should, they should um, basically it's, a, it's about, you know, um, having a clear, clear ideas on your credit requirements, the terms of license. So we're talking about the time period and the territory, fees and whether it's exclusive or non-exclusive. And for fees, it really depends, I have to say, because I've been in a situation where I've been told, you know, this is what we got um, and ya está. Or situations where they actually ask you, um, you know, how much would you charge for a one day assignment, two day assignment, etc. The the average, the range that I've worked with goes from. I, I'm sorry, I put it at the end of the presentation, but anyway, it's between 300 and 600 US dollars per day, um, and it really, really depends on usually the NGO whether whether it's big and if it has budget, and, and also the type of work. Mm -hmm. Um, could I ask um, Chiara, the, um, you get a lot of praise really for uh, sharing all this amazing information. I just want to pass this on to you. Um, when you talk about those budgets, um, are they kind of all in? So that means they would normally include, let's say, like the usage rights or any sort of like post-production? Is that all yeah. in? Yeah, um, yeah, I would say uh, usually they tell you like, for example, okay, we're, you know, we're going to license these images for three years for our uh, website, social media and report. Um, and usually it includes, it's a sort of package that includes uh, post-production and caption. Yeah. Time. Mm. Okay. Everything. Yeah. But you can, you know, when they ask you uh, for a quote, I mean, you, you know, there's various ways you could do it. You could do a full price or, I mean, I, I tend to give a complete price because uh, it's just simplifying things, but you could, you could potentially also break it down, um, you know, like a, a day shooting rate and an extra editing, uh, post-production and captioning half a day, for example, if it makes sense. Huh? Mm, yeah. Um... Yuda asks if you're doing your own post-production. Yeah, yeah, I have to say for, I think for, for what I do um, and also for budget, <laughs> budget reasons. Um, yeah, I, I also enjoy it, I have to say. I think it's part of the, it's also part of, uh, part of photography itself, right? It's also part of the creative process. Hmm. So I also like to do it myself to have more control over um, what's coming out. Okay. Okay. So, um, and then I think I mentioned in the initial diagram, right? To, to have your own, your own work um, at, at the core. Um, and so, just wanted to say that NGOs can be amazing for this, for your own personal projects, and they can really help out in terms of um, providing access to a certain environment or com community, as well as providing funding and visibility to your project. So I'm quickly gonna go 
Oh, that was one more. I'm quickly going to go through a few examples. So Unconventional Love is a project that I carried out with my colleague, Sara Magni. So it was the first time that I was collaborating with another photographer. And I think it really worked out because none of us has a big ego because I can totally see how this could also go very wrong. Um, but it was amazing. We were literally uh, taking out, uh, taking turns shooting. You know, sometimes I would hold the light, sometimes she would do it. We would kind of suggest things to each other. And then we went over all the editing process together. Um, it was really um, an amazing, collaboration and I really learned so much. So this was also interesting because it was the first time that I realized how collecting people's stories is as important as just taking pictures. Um, so we photographed 10 couples. It's a series about tomboys and trans men in Yangon. Um, Myanmar is plagued by colonial era law 377, which condemns homosexuality. And even though it's really enforced, it contributes to an atmosphere of fear and oppression. Social prejudices are further boosted by um, Buddhist practices and beliefs, where social position um, is determined by karma at birth. And accordingly, homosexuality is seen by the majority as a result of sexual transgressions and adultery perpetrated in your past life. So I was like, boom, wow, this is like super interesting topic. Um, you know, there, there's so much to explore. It, it was really something I was drawn to. And I, I wanted to mention this project because the first contacts of people to photograph, we met them at an LGBTQ festival run by an NGO. I will explain more on this soon, but um, also the organization running the festival loved the project and they ended up showing it um, during a photography event later in the year. The project um, was also published on Big Japan, which made it more sustainable and is a really nice magazine. That I like. Okay, and now, sorry, we're jumping to something <laughs> completely crazy. Um, uh, the, uh, question. Yeah. I've got one question here waiting for yeah. you from Dimitra. She asks, were there situations where you had difficulty gaining access for a project that you wanted? Could you advise on that? Yeah. Um, I will need to think about it. Uh, so I think. In this case, I mean, in this case for the portrait series, um, we made a few contacts and then we asked them if they knew other people that were happy to participate. So they knew it was a portrait project. And um, we, I actually, I know, sorry, this wasn't for another project that I prepared a leaflet. But anyway, um, I think we didn't do, I think that when we when we reached out, we definitely to some to some people that we tried, we we got some no's, but mostly it was like a word of mouth, and people that really wanted to tell their stories. Um, but let me, I, I maybe we can come back later uh, about uh, difficult access. Yeah, mm -hmm. think about it for some more examples. Okay, I've got another one here. Um, yeah. so they're, they're coming hard and fast. It's uh, one from Louis. He asks, um, thank you for sharing your fabulous work and experience with us. Do you plan to go back to Myanmar uh, again soon? How do you think recent events will affect working there? Also, have you had to adapt your working, your business process um, much post-COVID? Yes, um, I will go through it in the presentation. Uh, because okay. things changed quite a bit when I moved here. Uh, I have a few examples though, and but I am completely heartbroken. Unfortunately, I don't know uh, when I will be able to go back because the situation actually is really, really bad. And um, there was a military coup last year, uh, super brutal. And um, it, everything is different. It, it just actually, opened up uh, one month ago, commercial flights uh, restarted, but before it completely sealed off with, uh, I don't know, COVID or if it was just an excuse um, 
to seal it while they were doing their brutal oppression things. Um, but I would really love to. Um, I'm afraid it's going to be in a few years, though. Mm, okay. So, uh, okay. <laughs> Stay with me. The, uh, these are my these are my wedding pictures. Um, basically, what happened is that um, I saw these wedding photographs at a friend's house, and me and my girlfriend at the time thought they were amazing, and we really, really wanted to have them as well. Uh, the, the tiger, actually, we we asked to do it, but <laughs> the rest is kind of the original style of traditional Burmese wedding photography. So I went ahead, I booked the shoot at a photo studio in my neighborhood. And when we showed up, the photographer was very confused. I mean, the person owning the photo studio, because, um, you know, he asked me where my husband was. <laughs> and I said, I had no husband, and he was my wife. And anyway, everything was sorted out because most of the panic was uh, due to the fact that um, women makeup is more expensive than men makeup. So I just told them we were going to pay for two women having makeup. We had a great time with the makeup artists that were queer as well. And so that's it. But this project really got me thinking because I thought like, heck, you know, here I come with my white privilege as a foreigner. And, you know, when they asked me about their husband, I just laugh it away and, and, and things work out. But I mean, how would this be for, for an LGBTQ couple there, you know? I mean, would they face discrimination? Would they even think of doing it? Would they even be able to afford it? So I think I also had a photo crisis <laughs> around this time. I periodically, every two or three years, I have a photo crisis <laughs> where I ask myself if I, if I still love the medium like before, if it's still serving my purpose, if I, you know, if I can make any changes <laughs> in the world. But this also coincides with um, moments when I'm getting broke and when it's really hard to get your work out there. But usually these crises are really amazing moments because um, something interesting always comes out of them. And I just suddenly thought, you know, how amazing it would be for once to have, you know, the purpose of the project not to be just to document something, but to literally just provide people with their, with their wedding pictures. So this is how Burma Love came about um even though more and more young people want to appear in you know western clothes and sunglasses uh there is still this kind of traditional photography style with the beautiful clothing and the photoshop backgrounds that take you to places where the couples portrayed wouldn't be able to travel for a photo shoot so usually it's like a um, iconic locations or um, palaces and fancy hotels So it, it, I really, this project really took time because um, I started with four couples. I got some basic funding to cover the expenses, which were like the renting of a photo studio um, and uh, makeup and post-production. So I collaborate, basically I found a few photo studios and, um, and we worked together. So I was shooting the pictures, but then they were doing the post-production. And um, so we, we did uh, an exhibition um, at the French Institute in Yangon. It was great because it was also featured, you know, Vogue Italia talked about it and the couples were super, super happy and excited to be featured. Um, but, you know, of course, I also had concerns. Um, I had concerns because I, I didn't know if exposing them publicly was, was going to create problems. So. I had to really kind of, I, I had to wait and see. And in this case, we see, this is a picture of Honey and Zed and they're both human rights activists. And when they posted their wedding pictures on Facebook, they got like 1.5K comments and 2.4K shares. So it went completely viral and I started to freak out. And, but then, but then I had a chat with them and you know, finally everything was fine. Like they, of course they got some negative comments but also they just really, really wanted to tell the story because it was so important for them. And, and in some ways they were, they were prepared. 
Um, and this was uh, an editorial publication of the project, which which allowed me, and you can see some, it's nice for the backstage um, scenes. This allowed me to, to continue uh, photographing a few more couples. And one thing leads to another. So I started to get involved with um, Young on Pride. The festival was growing from a small film festival. It was going public for the first time uh, in a park. And I really wanted to get involved. So I reached out um, to the organizers and, and I ended up helping out both with event, which was um, which involved having concerts, uh, drag Olympics contest, as well as information booths um, on health, as well as a on the bottom right we see a picture of a river parade um, because we didn't have permission to do a public march. But I was especially focusing on photo exhibitions. So this was really, I think maybe my most rewarding experience. I think um, the fact that you could see all kinds of people so interested, there was, for example, I'll never forget that a, a policeman with a little baby that just was going through all the pictures, but really going through all the details, taking his time. And you, you, know, you could feel how the event was providing a space for LGBTQ people and how that was so important. So I could really see the, the power of photography to, to educate and, and, and bring people closer. So uh, some more collaborations with them. I shot some of the promotional material as well as some of the protagonists from a recent campaign that they had worked on. And this is Queen Nikki Rangoon in, in, uh, in her bedroom, which ended up being um, one of my favorite pictures. And Nikki really, you know, experienced a lot of um, widespread discrimination and prejudice, and she was afraid to walk on the streets and from living her authentic self. But um, you, things were starting to slowly change, and, and she was proudly fighting for her rights um, to equal job opportunities and to be legally recognized. I remember she was mentioning mobile phones and the internet at the time. Um, which, which I found really interesting because she said that that really played a big part in, in, in generally exposing people to different realities and somehow making them more accepted within the local community. But this was again before last year's uh, military coup. So it's been, it's been a super year, super heavy year of, of, of sadness and anger. Um, and there's not a single day that, that goes by without me thinking about um, Myanmar and, you know, friends that have died and friends that are in exile and friends that are hiding. And I really hope there will be justice soon and, and that they, you know, the beautiful Myanmar people will have the country they deserve. So I, moving away from Myanmar, I moved to the UK in 2019. And this is where I would like to focus on keeping on the lookout for all types of opportunities and ask for help when needed, which is super important. Um, of course, new country, new, new network to build, everything from scratch. And I think um, this was really important. You know, seizing every opportunity really ended up being um, fundamental. So I'm going to talk about um, two quick examples because we're running out of time. Sorry. Um, so one is about a project that I did for the European Institute for Gender Equality, which I would like to specify that is not an NGO, um, but it's an organization. It's a, a it's an EU policy institute that is dedicated exclusively to gender equality. So they wanted to create a sort of image bank for their website, their reports, you know, the topics that they work on. These are the topics they, they work on. And they wanted to use real situations as much as possible. So the stock images didn't really do the job. They often looked fake and there wasn't much diversity. I think they recognized it and they 
uh, they recognized the, that it was really hard to empathize with them. Um, and this is something super inter super important. I mean, if you think about the fact that it's, it's a research institute that's influencing new policy. So they, uh, they put out a tender, um, which I think step one was to write a motivational letter. <laughs> and given my writing skills, you can probably imagine how, how long it took me to do that. So, um, that's where I also would like to stress the importance of asking for help. Um, and then, um, you know, they, basically the application process included um, this technical offer, which needed to have a work plan and timelines on top of a sample portfolio and the financial offer. So in this case, the financial offer, basically the budget was super hard because it was divided by topic. Right, so it was super, super difficult to to estimate how long, how many days of work it was going to take me to to work on each topic. The only uh, guideline I had was that the maximum amount available was forty four thousand euro, but it was a six month job, right? Uh, and of course, in tenders you're competing, and then they judge. Uh, it's a whole basically judging method between the best application, but also the most um, convenient, let's say, you know, financially. So it's a bit of a delicate game. Um, <laughs> this is where, you know, the asking for help becomes really important. So I gave it a go at this uh, technical offer, you know, but I, so I put in all my input ideas, but then I had to ask a friend to give me a hand on writing like a clear structured plan. Um, about the project. And I also wanted to, so yeah, divided by, you know, time, um, phase one, research, outreach, uh, phase two, implementation, phase three, the, yeah, implementation of the second part. So I also wanted to mention it because NGOs became particularly important for this job because, um, a lot of the images that I ended up shooting for the Institute were from work that NGOs carry out. Um, so I, this is in Italy. It's um, a session of hypotherapy from an organization that works with kids with disability. And this is, for instance, the British Red Cross. Um, it's a women's support group. And then another example of basically how my work adapted here, um, which is more recent and, and on how you can uh, get involved with NGOs, how they can help out with access. Uh, more recently was this uh, grant for the European Journalism Center. It was a global health security call. So I collaborated on the story with a journalist friend, um, Sara Ferria. And uh, it was to develop a story on the health conditions of migrants and asylum seekers that are attempting the, the so-called game, which is basically illegal crossing into Croatia, which is EU territory, um, while living uh, in squats near the border. So bottom left, we have a young Tajik asylum seeker with his eight month old daughter that has been separated from his wife, who is already in Germany, and his waiting and, and waiting time for asylum are at the moment around two years. So you can see why people are um, attending, attempting the crossing. But I wanted to talk about it because in this case, we traveled uh, with IOM and UNHCR, which are not NGOs, but still organizations that fit the purpose of what I would like to say. So without them, we would have never found these people. Um, and it's just to say that sometimes the only way to access certain places and people uh, is, is, with, is through NGOs. And, and other times they just facilitate the work immensely because they are already well established within a certain community. Last slide, I promise. Um, and just a little summary that, you know, I recommend to, finally be proactive 
and seize every opportunity, follow up on contacts, propose ideas for collaboration, which is, the, uh, which is especially, you know, it can be well received by smaller NGOs that have limited resources. And this can always lead to more work. Get creative in ways which you can collaborate with them and take your time. I mean, good work takes time. Communicate this to the NGOs and others you are working with and just in general, building a good portfolio takes time and it's a never, a never ending process in the end, but it always leads to more work and be clear on arrangements. So what to expect, what to require, uh, usually basic, the basics are a term, terms of reference or briefing and then a contract that has details on the licensing, on the image use and the time period, and as well as fees. And as I mentioned earlier, in my experience, it's been around between three and 600 US dollars for a typical day rate or other exchanges. Thank you so much. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, that was such a such a such a lovely talk, and also, as I said before, so incredibly informative. Um, yeah, lots of applause coming in, um, just because the um, as you guys can see or not, I'm actually currently at London Institute of Photography, and I know we actually have some um, we actually have some online <laughs> courses actually waiting, like in twenty minutes. Um, so basically, they're using, uh, that's all my fault, they're all using the same Zoom account. I mean, in fact, we have multiple Zoom accounts for those occasions. It was just like my fault that I didn't communicate this before. But beforehand, I would like to ask you a few questions. Um, sure. With one, uh, thanks for your patience, um, Iman, that's been sitting here really for quite a long time. He asked, um, did you feel pressure to act a certain way while working there? Uh, did you ever feel getting judged? Um, just, the, just to clarify, I think you asked that uh, in relationship in context of the Jangon Pride event. Is that correct? And yeah, if you could maybe um, uh, maybe give us your, your reply. Did you, did you feel judged kind of working in those kind of environments? So in general, uh, you know, we were all very surprised when, when this NGO got the green light from the government to do a public event. It was the first time ever because before the festival was taking place on diplomatic grounds of the French Institute, uh, which is a very different thing, right? Suddenly they put in an application for a massive event. It's a yes. Wow, you know, we couldn't believe it. Um, there was a lot of stress because uh, when we were projecting films, basically they all had to go through uh, what is called the censorship board. So there was kind of a lot of stress because we didn't know how much we could push boundaries, both for films, but as well for photo exhibitions. Because when I was in charge of organizing them, I, you know, I was talking um with the local human rights activists all the time to see whether something potentially could have been too much because you never know when you step one one step over the boundary and then kaput the show you know the event is over right but at the same time we really wanted to raise awareness um so it was a bit of a fine line um and there was always quite a bit of stress uh but it was definitely a lurk, learning cor curve, like bit, bit by bit, you push a little bit more. And um, does it answer the question? I think so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I guess you, you really have to feel your way forward, I guess, with a lot of sensitivity and, yeah, well, maybe some experience as well. Mm. Yeah, yeah, to have That's a feel for the, con the, the, the context, yeah. Mm, yeah, we've got another one from um, Muktadir. He asks, um, "Do you have any uh, future projects planned um, having coming uh, coming up in the UK?" Yes, so I'm still. I became very slow <laughs> with working on personal stuff, also because it's a bit. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's also the aging process, <laughs> but. Um, I am still researching. It's been months of research. So I would really love to do a project on um, older LGBTQ people. And, um, you know, there's so many interesting points to raise. Um, 
and 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 I think they could also bring a lot to the conversation. So I'm still trying to figure out the way the way to do it because I really feel like you know audio and video, for example, would be would be potentially a way to go. But I have some video experience, but I'm still a little bit you know um, I guess scared of it. <laughs> So, and I'm still trying to figure out whether whether um, reaching out to some NGOs that work with them could be the way. Mm. And then, um, so this would be here. And then I'm also working on something completely different, uh, which is, a, it, it's a book about, uh, it's a very kind of personal and intimate project about becoming a, a non-biological queer parent. So this, in this case, it has a lot of writing uh, pictures, but also, uh, archival material and uh, some collages so it's something yeah completely new and more personal yeah mm. okay super we had i think you just by coincidence answered the last question we had from iman um he said um thank you for explaining well it is nice to understand where you're coming from just a quick question you plan to uh, stay working in the uh, LGBTQ uh, area of work, as you have just uh, replied. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, thank you so much to thank you. you guys. That was thank such an amazing talk. Yeah? Uh, thank, thank you so much for really uh, an amazing and engaged crowd. Um, hope to see you again soon. Uh, we are currently working on the new uh, talk, which probably is going to happen. As far as I remember, it's going to happen in about three weeks time probably going to be on a Wednesday afternoon again. I think that really seems to be something like a, like a time when uh, lots of people are available. And everyone, don't forget to check out the, uh, to check out, uh, the talk that we're going to uh, publish very soon on our webpage. Um, from the LLP side, there's lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, we can't be working on a bit like a membership scheme, etc. cetera. Uh, we have, uh, planning an, an open day that's going to happen at the same time as our annual exhibition that's going to happen during free range. Um, so come back, um, probably next time I can tell, tell you much more about this kind of things as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care and Ciao. see you soon. Thank you, Kiara. Ciao, bye-bye.